led to the development of the MQTT protocol and why is it becoming so important now? MQTT started out life in 1999, which is 15 years ago now. Um, it's a long time in, in, in technology uh, to have something that's, that's lasted that long in many ways. And it was it developed to solve a particular problem that two companies were collaborating on, IBM and Arcom. They were working on uh, field-based industrial systems, pipelines, monitoring oil pressures in pipelines, a lot of the systems that existed were closed and proprietary, and they required the manufacturer to uh, enable access to the data they were, they were flowing. So IBM and Arcom looked at the problem and developed this new protocol, MQTT, a lightweight solution for getting data from these kinds of systems. And they then continued to use that over a number of years, primarily in industrial automation situations. And what's different about MQTT protocols from HTTP options? And who's using it? Okay, so there's two questions there. Let's right. take them one yes, at a yes. time. Uh, HTTP is a request response protocol for getting uh, stuff off the internet onto, originally onto a web browser. Okay, but it's, it's primarily I make a request and I get some data back. With MQTT, it's a broadcast protocol. So you're constantly just broadcasting, publishing data to the world, and it doesn't matter who's listening to it. So people can choose to what we call subscribe to topics containing data they're interested in. Think of it like following your favorite stock tracker or um, subscribing to um, a topic in your newsreader on your, on your uh, mobile device. So it's quite different from HTTP. HTTP's got a bunch of other semantics which are very different to MQTT as well. I don't, I'm not going to go into all of them in, in, in particular detail, but it's, um, it's primarily a text-based protocol. MQTT is binary and very, very compact, which makes it ideal for this kind of emerging space of the Internet of Things that we're talking about because we can keep our data sizes very low. And that matters still, even 15 years after the protocol was invented, when we're talking about uh, battery usage on a mobile device, uh, network consumption on your data plan. All of those kind of things are important. So actually just rewinding a little bit back to why this is still important after 15 years, and in fact, there's a lot more interest in it, because of this emerging space of Internet of Things, we're finding that this you know, supposedly ancient protocol from 15 years ago is a really great fit for the space that we're looking at with the Internet of Things. In terms of who's using it, we've got some um, many, many, many examples. The kind of big famous one that everybody talks about is, is Facebook, who adopted it for use in their Messenger pro, uh, program. And that was primarily, as they originally wrote, because they found it was very low on bandwidth, very low on battery use. So it's great for their users that they're not finding that, hopefully, their Facebook apps are constantly draining their battery just or, or data plans just because of transferring data. There are loads of other examples, though. Some of the older ones are, again, in that same space of things like industrial automation. So Conoco Phillips still use it for monitoring their oil pipelines today. Uh, we also have energy companies who use it for smart grid solutions. So there's a one called Concert uh, in the US that does that. Uh, it's used for monitoring, for example, uh, pacemaker patients, which I think is a great example of using technology to improve people's lives. Instead of having those patients have to go to a clinic on a regular basis to have checks on their pacemaker, uh, the clinics can, do, can take traces of those pacemakers remotely overnight over a low, a low power network uh, and just keep an eye on those patients. And if there is a problem, they can obviously bring them into the clinic rather than having to constantly have them coming in for checks. Um, another example, it seems a little bit more trivial, but um, recently uh, an Italian uh, company has helped Illy, the coffee manufacturer, uh, to put it into their coffee machines. So those coffee machines can now upload commercial ones, upload usage data and diagnostic information over MQTT back to base. But there's also loads of fun examples. It's very simple to use. It's very easy to use in things like Arduino. We've had at OzCon this week, we've had the kids playing with Arduinos and, and Raspberry Pis. It's a super simple solution to getting those kind of things to publish data from their sensors to the internet. So people are using it for home automation. Uh, they're using it for uh, smart badge systems, for access to hack spaces, all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's used all over the place. So it's incredibly relevant for the Internet of Things space. Absolutely. Um, looking at, we've talked about some closed walled proprietary kinds of, of things, and MQTT is an open uh, protocol. Right. 
how do you see the Internet of Things ecosystems evolving? Are, are they going to move beyond the closed walled into this more open space, or what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I think it depends on your definition of what the Internet of Things is all about. And to me, the reason the Internet has been successful is because it was built on a bunch of open and distributed protocols that many people have been able to implement and use. And they all interoperate, by the way. Uh, and I think one of the issues with the Internet of Things, when you look at it purely from a, if you like, a, 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 a one company's ecosystem perspective, the, you're beginning to see a lot of these companies wanting to build their own walled gardens and keep the da their users' data inside those walled gardens. Well, we're open source people. Uh, we believe in the power of collaboration. We believe the power of interoperability. Who's to say that the, uh, the fitness tracking data I get from one of my devices shouldn't interoperate with another device from another manufacturer and share that information to improve my lifestyle. I don't want to have to necessarily buy all of my devices from one manufacturer just because things only work inside that ecosystem. And I think that's been an emerging um, trend in computing and technology over the last 20 years. Uh, we know that things like Windows and Mac and Linux can interoperate at different levels, be that within file formats, be that over the internet actually making calls to one another, uh, be that streaming music, people expect to be able to consume their data where they want it, regardless of the manufacturer. So I believe myself that openness is really, really important here. Uh, I can't predict the future, and there are lots of new innovations. I know that uh, Google and Nest have recently uh, uh, announced some uh, new consortium around the Internet of Things. I know that Apple have announced HomeKit for their uh, devices, and it remains to be seen how those things uh, will interoperate or whether they'll become data silos. But I think people are increasingly aware of ownership of their own data and privacy uh, and they desire um, to use it you know, for themselves to their own benefit rather than having other people control it for them. And turning the corner just a little bit here, tell me what, tell me about the Eclipse PayHo project. What is that? Okay, so Eclipse PayHo is actually an implementation of MQTT. It started in, I think, 2011 when IBM donated the code that they had been selling to customers um, to this Eclipse open source project. Now, Eclipse was partly founded by IBM. It was a big donation of code from IBM that started the whole Eclipse uh, IDE project and the foundation there. And over time, that Eclipse foundation has grown to accommodate many, many more different types of projects. Paho is just one Internet of Things project at Eclipse. Uh, and it is just for, actually, MQTT client libraries. So that enables you to write applications in Java or in, uh, in JavaScript or in C, C++, etc., that talk to an MQTT server or broker. The broker itself is provided by another project. There was a project called Mosquito that started in 2009. Um, I think it's actually the most important project in terms of it, MQTT uh, emerging as a standard in the Internet of Things because it was the point at which there was an open source implementation. Up until then, all the implementations had been proprietary and you'd had to pay for them and at which a community began to fall. And I'm super excited about that. Mosquito started in 2009 by a gentleman called Roger Light in the UK. All of his own, all his own work and it's been an independent project. Recently joined the Eclipse Foundation as well. Um, the benefit of that is that now companies who want to use it get to use it under the Eclipse Public License. And we know that the Eclipse Public License, like Apache, is a very, very popular uh, license for people to use, companies to reconsume because it gives you lots of uh, freedom but also lots of protections. Um, so it's a very commercial friendly license as well as being open source. So it's going to play quite a big role then in the Internet of Things. I think so. I mean, if you look at what Eclipse is is doing around the Internet of Things. We now have a, a proposal for a top-level project at Eclipse for the Internet of Things, which all of the other projects that belong in that space can live under. So Eclipse has a runtime um, project. It has a tools project. These are, sorry, they're top-level projects that contain other projects. So the tools may be the IDE. The runtime might be some of the Java runtimes that Eclipse uh, looks after. But the Internet of Things is now going to be not only Paho and Mosquito, which are MQTT projects, but they're going to support other protocols like CoAP under the Californium project that they've come up with. CoAP's another standard protocol for the Internet of Things. Uh, they have other projects that enable us to bridge between these protocols. So there's one called Eclipse Ponte, which is Italian for bridge, 
uh, which enables you to actually bridge between HTTP, MQTT, and CoAP. This is really important because the internet is made up of people who consume data on their mobile devices over HTTP and things which transmit data over CoAP or MQTT or, in some cases, HTTP. So it's really important that we have that interoperability and the ability to, to bridge between them. So, I mean, I've just mentioned maybe four out of 15 projects or more that Eclipse has uh, in the Internet of Things. And this is one reason why I think open source is going to be great here. And Eclipse is going to be a really big part of it. Um, it's, it's really growing very, very fast. And it's really important that we have solid open source implementations that people can pick up and reuse to build these kind of solutions that we, we're also excited about when we talk about this kind of with starry eyes, this amazing Internet of Things opportunity we have. One other thing I'd mention is that the Internet of Things, I personally believe, will not necessarily be one thing. It will not be like one standard and one protocol that does everything. You talked earlier or asked earlier about uh, proprietary companies building their own ecosystems. Companies will continue to build their own products. So there's going to be different op opportunities here. For one example, I might be interested in monitoring my, my fitness using my health bracelets and my wearables and my scale, connected scales. That's one little kind of pocket of my Internet of Things. Internet of my things, I think, is what Microsoft call it. And I think that's a really important point because those things are relevant to me, but your experience of the Internet of Things might be something completely different. News being delivered to your mirror in the morning as you, as you get up, maybe, because we may have a screen embedded in there or something. So, and and the, the fact that you know, we've got these systems now that can learn more about our preferences and, and tailor that information for us. So really, um, I think the Internet of Things will be m many different things um, made up of these open source technologies. Okay, well, thank you very much for talking with me today. You're very welcome.